Audio Fiction Magazine. Uh, volume 1, uh, number 3, page 27. You couldn't do a scary voice? Sorry. Volume 1. Oh, never mind. We'll just oh, go on. Yeah. I'm your horrifying host, Rish Outfield. And I'm your horrendous host, Big Anklevich. Wait a minute. That's not <laughs> such a good one, is it? Leave it in. Leave it in. We are joined today by the voices of Bennett Jackson, Nicole Sedeth, and Oliver Donahue. Helping us out with today's story. And what is that story? Today's scary story is... <clears throat> today's scary story is The Ghost of Sadie Worth by Doug McIntyre. I'm Doug McIntyre, author of The Ghost of Sadie Worth. This is a scary story that was pulled from my childhood, and although it's fiction, there are certain details that do resonate with truth. I'll tell you more about that in the author's note after you hear the story. So, without further delay... The Ghost of Sadie Worth by Doug McIntyre The old man leaned in. So did we. Once we were all in close, he whispered, I believe in Sadie Worth. Those were the secret words that would bring out the ghost of the dead witch. You just say those words over and over again, the man continued, like a chant. I don't remember who the old man was. He was someone that Tommy knew. It was Tommy's idea to do something different for Halloween. Although we all liked the candy, we thought that we were getting a little too old for trick-or-treating. We were almost teenagers, for Christ's sake. But you have to do more than just say the words. The old man admonished us. You have to believe them. The four of us exchanged glances. We did believe. At least I did. And judging from the wide-eyed expressions of the other boys, I think they did too. We all nodded to the old man, none of us able to find our voices. What if we're in the wrong cemetery? Josh asked. Yeah, what if she isn't buried there? Eric added. It don't matter what cemetery, the old man told us. The only thing that matters is the words. We nodded in understanding. Now you better be getting home, the old man told us. We all got up and thanked him. He shook each of our hands and we turned to leave. You mind what I told you, and you'll see Sadie Worth. The old man added, chuckling a little to himself. (laughs) We We will, we agreed. We didn't say anything for a long time after we left. We were almost halfway home before Eric broke the silence. You think it's real? He asked. It's real, Tommy said. So we're going to do it? Eric asked. I am, Tommy said. Me too, Josh agreed. I just nodded my head in confirmation. Okay, then, Eric continued. We meet tomorrow night. We all knew the plan. Tomorrow was Halloween. We were going to meet at Tommy's house at dusk. Once it was fully dark, we were going to sneak over to the cemetery that was across the street from where he lived. We were going to call the ghost of Sadie Worth. We said our goodbyes and split up, each of us headed toward our own house. I was lost in my thoughts, thoughts about tomorrow, Thoughts about what the old man said, and thoughts about Sadie Worth. The next night, we all met up at Tommy's house at the appointed time. We each said hello to Tommy's mom and then went up to his room, where we conspired behind his closed door. We were wearing Halloween costumes, but we had regular clothes on underneath. The plan was to tell his mom we were going out trick-or-treating, then once outside, ditch the costumes and go to the cemetery. His mom didn't suspect a thing. We got out of the house with no trouble at all. We went around to the side of Tommy's house and peeled off the costumes, stashed them behind a bush, and then made our way across the street. Tommy's neighborhood was a favorite for trick-or-treaters, it having a real honest-to-God cemetery there. 
What could possibly be a better location to go trick-or-treating on Halloween? We had to wait a few minutes before we were able to get to the graveyard undetected. Eric opened the squeaking gate, setting all of our nerves on end. It was just like in a horror film. I didn't know about my friends, but I was more than a little scared. I was trying to act brave. I think they were, too. I could tell, even in the darkness, by their nervous glances and the way they jumped at little sounds. Josh closed the still squeaking gate behind, fraying our nerves yet again. Once inside the cemetery proper, we stopped. Where should we go? Tommy asked. Somewhere near the back, I said. It seemed like a good idea when I said it, until I realized how scary it was to walk through a cemetery at night. They didn't argue, so we made our way to the back. Eric took the lead. He didn't seem to be in any hurry. It was almost as if his legs didn't want to take him. While we were working our way through the headstones, we were suddenly caught in a flood of light coming from the road. We recognized it immediately as a car approaching. I was frozen in the light until Josh yelled, Car! Hide! I ducked down behind a headstone and saw that the other three hid as well. The approaching car pulled onto the shoulder of the road near the cemetery entrance, and we heard the driver turn the engine off. I thought we were caught before we'd even started. It didn't matter that we weren't doing anything wrong. Just the idea of someone finding us in a cemetery on Halloween was enough to scare the shit out of me. We heard car doors open, and then heard four of them slam shut, indicating that there were at least four passengers. I'm telling you, I saw something, a male voice from near the car said. Stop it, you're scaring us. A female voice whined. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just saying I saw something. The male voice continued, also whining a little. Although it was dark, there was a moon out and our eyes had adjusted some. We could see that it was two boys and two girls from the car. I could also see each of my companions hiding out behind headstones. Tommy took the lead and signaled that we should make our way toward the back of the cemetery. He led by example, keeping low and out of sight, ducking from one row of headstones to the next. The rest of us followed suit until we were all between the last row of the headstones and the back fence of the cemetery. A farmer's field was behind the cemetery, amber rows of dead cornstalks apparent, even in the darkness. If we had to, we could hop the fence and lose ourselves in the corn before anyone could find us. The people from the car came through the squeaky gate and came about halfway to the back before they stopped next to the only mausoleum in the cemetery. By now, we could tell that they were only kids, too. They were older than us, having a car and all, but still kids. Hey, is this the one? One of the boys asked. Yeah, I think so, the other boy said. We could see that they were passing something around between them. It looked like a small bottle. We realized that they were drinking. Come on, let's get up, the first boy said, jumping up onto one of the bigger headstones. What's so special about that one? A girl asked. A ghost is supposed to knock you off if you sit up here, the first boy said. I'm not getting up there, the other girl said. Don't be chicken, the first boy taunted. Just then, more headlights illuminated the graveyard. The boy on top of the headstone tumbled off the back of it. The other three ducked behind gravestones, too. The second car pulled off the road in front of the first. The kids from the first car peeked out from their hiding places. In a second, a spotlight lit up the graveyard like it was daytime. Come on out! A deep voice called from the second car. It only took us a second to figure out it was the police. We could hear the other kids whispering, but we couldn't tell what they were saying. We know you're in there! The booming voice continued. Why don't you just come on out here? The girls surrendered first, standing up and showing themselves in the spotlight. The boys followed soon after. They all walked up to where the police held their spotlight on them, the kids holding their hands up to shade their eyes from the bright light. What do we do? Josh whispered hoarsely. Be quiet, Tommy commanded. We were too afraid to do anything else, though I thought about giving myself up too. Once the kids were near the police car, we could hear their muffled voices as they talked, but we couldn't hear much of what they said. One time, we heard the bass voice of the cop asking if they'd been drinking. We distinctly heard one of the boys answer, No, sir. Anyone else here with you? The cop asked. No, sir, the voice repeated. The cop passed his spotlight over the cemetery to be sure. We stayed hidden, waiting. The police told the other kids to go home. The interior light of their car showed us they were complying. Once the kids drove off, the police passed their spotlight over the cemetery one more time for good measure then got into their own car and drove off. Phew. Josh sighed. I thought we were busted. 
Me too, Eric agreed. Let's get out of here, I added. Get out of here? Tommy asked. What do you mean, get out of here? Well, I thought... I started to say, but I didn't get a chance to finish. We came out here to call out Sadie Worth. You're not afraid, are you? Tommy asked. I was afraid. I was afraid of getting caught by the cops. It was a close call, and we were lucky they were too lazy to walk around the cemetery. If they had, they would have found us. My folks would kill me if they knew I was here instead of trick-or-treating. But as I sat there behind the headstone thinking, I realized that cops weren't the only thing I was afraid of. I was sitting in a cemetery, getting ready to call out a ghost. And not just any ghost, one that used to be a witch. Yes, I was scared. Still, I couldn't show weakness. Not to Tommy. The others might let me get away with it, but not Tommy. No, I'm not afraid, I said, displaying my best false bravado. Wait here, Tommy told us. He walked over to the mausoleum where the other kids had been. The rest of us just stood up and watched him. Yes! Tommy exclaimed after less than a minute. What'd you find? Eric asked in some combination of a shout and a whisper. I found the booze. Tommy replied, walking back triumphantly, carrying the bottle in front of him for all of us to see. It was one of those small bottles shaped like a flask. Tommy removed the cap and took a swig before passing it around to the rest of us. When it was my turn, I took a larger swig than I'd intended. I didn't know how much it would burn my throat, and I coughed. <coughs> a lot. <coughs> The other boys laughed at me, but I took another drink the next time it passed around, making sure it was more of a sip than a swig. Once it was down, I was surprised at how much it warmed me up. The bottle passed around twice more before Tommy recapped it. We'll save the rest of it for later, he said, shoving the bottle into one of his back pockets. I was surprised at how much better I felt. I wasn't so afraid all of a sudden. It seemed perfectly natural to be here with my friends, ready to call on Sadie Worth. Let's do it here. Tommy said, moving out to an area without many headstones. I wondered if there were no headstones because no one was buried here, or if the graves might be too old and the headstones had all crumbled to dust. You ready? Tommy asked. The moment was upon us. In spite of the courage provided by the burning, soothing liquid from the flask, fear still gripped me. I glanced around at the other boys and noticed that I could see a little more white in their eyes than was usual. I wasn't the only one afraid. But the others were also trying not to show it. Tommy flopped down on the ground, sitting in a cross-legged position, and the rest of us plopped down beside him, forming a rough circle. Josh was on one side of Tommy, Eric on the other. I sat across from him. Tommy's back was to the front of the cemetery where the cars had been parked, mine to the back fence. Tommy put out his hands, palms up, for Josh and Eric to take them. Josh and Eric followed suit, and I took each of their hands. They were clammy and sweaty, probably like mine were. Now remember, Tommy admonished us, it isn't enough just to say the words, we have to believe them. We all nodded in agreement, but Tommy wouldn't accept that for an answer. Eric, do you believe in Sadie Worth? He asked, looking directly at him. Yes, Eric said. Say it, Tommy told him. I believe in Sadie Worth, Eric replied. A chill ran up my back. Tommy looked at Josh. Do you believe in Sadie Worth? Tommy asked him, staring hard. I heard Josh swallow before he answered. I believe in Sadie Worth, Josh finally said. Then Tommy looked at me. Time stood still as his blue eyes bore into mine. Do you believe in Sadie Worth? He asked me, his voice almost a whisper. In spite of his seriousness, I thought his antics seemed a bit theatrical. I hesitated in my response. The gravity of the situation struck me. I thought that admitting, out loud, that I believed in the ghost of a dead witch had to be wrong. I was suddenly aware that this wasn't just some childish prank. This was real. Do you believe in Sadie Worth? Tommy asked again, emphasizing the syllables to drive his point home. I thought that maybe it would have been better if the cops had found us. Then they would have made us go home. I wouldn't have to answer Tommy's question. I never should have agreed to this. I should be out collecting candy. That's what kids do on Halloween. They don't sit around in cemeteries looking for witches or ghosts. They go trick-or-treating. For some reason, I knew that the old man's words were true. If you said the words, and you believed, truly believed, then it would happen. 
the ghost of Sadie Worth would come out. And I did believe. I couldn't help it. I thought that maybe if I could fake it, if I didn't really believe it would happen, then I could say the words and we wouldn't have to worry about seeing a ghost. But I did believe, and I knew that the other boys did too. I was filled with dread. Do you believe in Sadie Worth? Tommy asked once more, the tone of his voice indicating that he was getting mad. I believe in Sadie Worth, I told him in resignation of what I thought was inevitable. Tommy let out a sigh of relief. I believe in Sadie Worth, he said. And then he repeated the words, changing the emphasis. I believe in Sadie Worth, he said them again. I believe in Sadie Worth. His words took on a chant-like quality, a rhythm that indicated the rest of us were supposed to join in. I, I believe in Sadie, Sadie Worth. Worth, Eric said with him on the next cadence. I, I believe in Sadie, Sadie Worth. Worth. Josh joined in. I, I believe, believe in Sadie, Sadie Worth. Worth, we all said in unison. I believe in Sadie Worth. I don't know about the others, but I closed my eyes. I gripped the hands of my friends as we said those words again and again. I believe in Sadie Worth. I believe in Sadie Worth. I imagined the words as real things, something that I could reach out and touch. And I did, caressing the smoothness, the fiber, the symmetry of the words. And then they became more than words. They became some kind of focal point, a portal. It was as if the words were a gateway to something else. I believe in Sadie Worth. We said them over and over. They became hypnotic, as if we weren't calling Sadie Worth to us. We were going to her. It was like we were leaving the cemetery, leaving our bodies behind us. Our bodies didn't matter. We didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was the words. I believe in Sadie Worth. I believe in Sadie Worth. We would change the emphasis on the words, change the cadence. I don't know if it was a conscious effort or if it was more natural, but we did it. It wasn't as if I was concentrating on how the words sounded. It was just the impression that came to me. And then another impression came to me. One that we were not alone. I squeezed my eyes shut, tightening them against what I felt was there. I also felt the hands of Josh and Eric tighten on mine, each individually, independent of the other. I didn't know what it was I felt, but in those moments I knew that they felt it too. I believe in Sadie Worth. I hadn't realized it before, but the words were louder and faster, as if our desire could force Sadie Worth to appear. Whether it was our intensity or our belief, I don't know. But suddenly I couldn't stand it anymore, and I opened my eyes. I saw that the other boys had their eyes shut tightly. I could tell, even in the darkness. But what caught my attention more than the other boys was the woman who was standing over Tommy. She had come up behind him, her white dress and dark, long hair flowing behind her. For a second, I thought that I was seeing something naughty, that her gown was some kind of sleepwear, sheer like a negligee. But then I realized that it wasn't lingerie. It was a dress, and it was as insubstantial as the woman who wore it. I could see not only through the gown, but through the entire woman. In an instant, I realized that the woman standing over Tommy was indeed the ghost of Sadie Worth. Her face was gaunt, her expression one of despair and anguish. Fear gripped me in a way I could not fully comprehend. My mouth fell open with terror. I wanted to warn Tommy of the apparition that was behind him. But I had no voice. I wanted to run, but I couldn't move. I couldn't even disengage my hands from Josh and Eric's grip. I was trapped. I stopped chanting, and I think it was only the absence of my voice that alerted the others to the danger that was upon us. I saw Tommy open his eyes in accusation until he saw my expression. He jerked his head up, and he looked behind him. I don't know what he expected to see, Sadie Worth or the other kids returning for their bottle of liquor. In any case, while I was frozen with fear, he was instantly motivated to action. He immediately let go of his friend's hands and jumped up, barely missing the ghost behind him, and sprang away from her. Once he was on his feet, he ran, not toward the front of the cemetery, but toward the rear and the fence. Eric and Josh both opened their eyes, I suppose in the shock of Tommy letting go. They looked around and saw Tommy running, as well as the ghost bearing down on us. They broke their contact with me, and my sudden freedom thrust me into action, spurred on by witnessing Tommy's own decisiveness. 
I jumped to my feet, but unlike Tommy, I headed for the gate of the cemetery. I could see the witch turn toward me as I passed beside her, which only motivated me on to greater speeds. Some part of me was aware of other apparitions that were floating around the cemetery, but whether they had been summoned by our chance for Sadie Worth, or if it was because of All Hallows' Eve, I didn't know. And I didn't wait to find out. I ran, for all I was worth. I didn't even wait for Josh or Eric. They were on their own, though I could tell by their screams that they weren't far behind. I reached the screeching gate, wishing the cops had left it open. I didn't bother to close it, and I don't think Josh or Eric did either. They were both faster runners than I was, and soon we were side by side on our way back to Tommy's house. We peeled around the side to the bushes where we'd hidden our costumes. I stopped, gasping for breath, amazed that I was that winded from such a short sprint. Eric and Josh were just as short of breath. Perhaps it was from the fear. As I struggled to regain my breath, I looked around for Tommy. He didn't come out the front of the cemetery with us. He went out the back. I asked the others. None of us saw him, but we assumed that he jumped over the fence. He should be here any second. But I wasn't about to hang around. Without a word, I picked up my costume and turned to leave. Neither Josh nor Eric questioned me. They picked up their costumes and we began to run again. We were going home. I was constantly looking over my shoulder to see if someone or something was chasing us. But the ghost of Sadie Worth didn't appear to me again. It seemed an eternity before I finally made it home. I went inside and went right to my bedroom, ignoring my mother when she asked me how the trick-or-treating was. I met up with Josh and Eric the next day before school started. Have you seen Tommy? Josh asked. We both shook our heads. Me neither, he said. I shared my first period class with Tommy, and I kept expecting him to show up at the last second, but he wasn't there when the final bell rang. The math teacher marked him absent. We kept watching for him throughout the morning, but he never arrived. Just after lunch, the three of us were hauled into the principal's office. He was sitting behind the desk, reading something, making us wait the way principals like to do. We all sat quietly in chairs facing him, wondering what we had done wrong. Finally, the principal looked up from his desk at us. Do you know why I've called you in today? He asked. We just shook our heads. Why don't you tell me about last night? He suggested. We went trick-or-treating. Josh volunteered. Was Tommy Jenkins with you? He asked. At first, but then he went off on his own. Eric told him, barely stretching the truth. Well, his mother is worried sick. She said that the four of you went trick-or-treating, and she hasn't heard from him since. She found his costume behind some bushes beside the house. He paused to let it all sink in. He finally continued. She was wondering if you might know something about his whereabouts. That was several years ago now, the last time that the four of us were all together. They never did find Tommy, alive or dead. I like to think that maybe he's still running, that somehow he got away. But I know he didn't. She must have caught him. Maybe he sacrificed himself so the rest of us could get away. I don't really know. I've mentioned it to my therapist, but she isn't much help because I can't tell her what happened. Not what really happened. She'd think I was crazy. Hell, maybe I am. But I know two things. I don't celebrate Halloween anymore. And I will never, ever say her name aloud again. You see, the problem is... I do believe. Author's Note I'm Doug McIntyre author of The Ghost of Sadie Worth. As I said in the introduction, this story resonates with some truth from my childhood. The home I grew up in was out in the country, across the road from a cemetery. As kids, we used to go to the cemetery to play. One of the things we used to do was chant for The Ghost of Sadie Worth. We would convince ourselves that it was true and then run from the cemetery, screaming in terror. I can't say that I ever truly saw The Ghost of Sadie Worth, but there were a lot of times that I believed I saw the ghost, and to a kid, believing is almost as good as seeing. Anyway, that's the story. 
and I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it. It brought back a bit of nostalgia for me, as well as a firm belief that I will never, ever chant the words aloud that you heard in the podcast. Feel free to leave me a comment on the Dune Steve website. And if you'd like to know more about me or some of my other writing, you can visit my website at www.dougmcintyre.com. Until next time, I'm Doug McIntyre, and you've been listening to my story, The Ghost of Sadie Worth. And welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that story. Why do you always say hope you enjoyed it? Who gives a sh... Oh, we're on? Yes. Welcome back. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that story. <clears throat> yeah, because it was a good one. That was the first of our October Scary Story finalists. And you may be wondering, why are we doing October Scary Stories in February? Well, the answer? The answer is, as Ministry said, every day is Halloween. Hey, that sounded better when you did it. R-O-8-O-T? R-O... What's his name? O-8-O-T. O-8-O-T. Never mind, leave it in. So... Way back in October, I asked people to send in some scary stories, and the deadline was October 31st, the greatest day of the year. And a couple of people sent them in, and rather than waiting until next October,